Hi everyone, I'm Bruno Ziza and welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is the place we come to learn from data leaders who've experienced amazing growth, amazing success. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Ryan, who's VP of Engineering at Tokopedia. Tokopedia is uh, based in Asia. It's a fast moving organization, millions of customers, millions of products. And Ryan's going to tell us everything about their scale. Ryan, thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us today. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, thanks for the quick introduction. Glad to be on the show. All right, well, let's dive right into it. Not many people might know who Tokopedia is, so what do you guys do? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, based out of in Indonesia, Tokopedia initially started off uh, about a decade ago uh, in the marketplace space, uh, and uh, eventually we have grown crazily. We've got over uh, we've got over five hundred million products. We've got. Uh, We've got a whole bunch of businesses across payment, fintech, uh, logistics, uh, uh, digital products. We've got 40 digital products. We reach 99% districts in Indonesia and got about 11 million merchants. So that's uh, where we've come over the last 10 years. And so you've built this this super ecosystem. It's marketplace, four business lines: marketplace, digital goods, fintech and payment, logistics, retail. So that means you have a lot of data and you're introducing a lot of products every week. And so tell us a little bit about the use cases. How are you using this data uh, to run a better business and create better experiences for your customers? So why Tokopedia is all about democratizing commerce for our end customers. We also internally want to make sure that, you know, we initially started off with the physical goods business, but as we scale up and launch more businesses, each business that is spun off, you know, what can they benefit out of the ecosystem? And now one thing is, you know, you have the rich cash flow, you have the customer base, but also beyond that, how you can quickly spin off, what are the assets are there? Obviously, the next big one is data. So that's where we want to see, you know, what we can leverage, uh, what data sets we can leverage. That will not only help uh, new businesses come on board, but will also in turn benefit our customers. If there's a certain gaps that they had in their overall journey or in their life, you know, how it can be filled. That's something where we've really uh, invested uh, a bit. And so you use, from an infrastructure standpoint, you use BigQuery, Bigtable, Dataflow, PubSub, and you've created kind of these environments where you have a customer data platform, a product data platform, a merchant data platform to create these experiences. Tell us, you know, how do they work together and what's the infrastructure under that? That's a good question. So in fact, we use uh, we are early adopters of literally every product that uh, the Google Data Team launches. So in fact, when they were when you were building out your data catalog, we were one of the first customers. Uh, forget about scale, but we were one of the first customers because I think the notion behind our evolution is you know we are very lean. Uh, we till 2020 we had 15 data engineers considering the kind of scale and the, the kind of data volumes that we have. Uh, what we did is we did we did trans, uh, transitions. We started off like a typical startup. You want to keep costs low. You want to start off with uh, open source tooling. We used Druid. We deployed Druid. But then we realized that you know it's it's reached a point uh, where in our sellers are being affected and our business growth is being affected. And that's when we transitioned onto the data platform. We started uh, the first one was obviously PubSub to sync the data and BigQuery to get uh, to create your data lake and warehouse and everything else from there on. Uh, so you're right, uh, we use about at least seven of them. We largely use seven of those products out there. So that's amazing. And you've done this migration to your seller analytics engine. Tell us a little bit about that. What's the use case like? Seller analytics uh, was an interesting area considering the number of businesses and offerings that we had to a seller, whether he's looking at marketing, he's looking at uh, payment, fintech, using some of our uh, fintech products to further grow his business. Uh, you know, uh, if he has one dollar, where is he going to leverage that dollar? And how is he going to track uh, how well it's doing? So. From that standpoint, we realized that you know our old data warehouse really could not scale. Now, when we look at sellers, sellers exist in different personas, in different shapes, and different sizes. So it really creates a whole bunch of these options that we need to provide to keep to keep a considerable uh, volume of our sellers happy. Uh, 
Uh, that's why we realized that previously, if we wanted to build a specific widget, uh, a specific performance widget. Now, what's a widget? A widget is basically just uh, it, it is just some statistics that will be available to a seller uh, depending on the different products he uses. Now, uh, he could have widgets in terms of showing him his sales, uh, his sales by region. He could have widgets in terms of showing him his overall delivery SLAs in terms of you know how his marketing has been doing, what's his conversion rates. Uh, so, so we realized that you know. Looking at all these different combinations, we needed we needed a dynamic uh, platform. We needed something that we, wherein uh, every business team, twenty two businesses that we have, could go and spin off widgets very quickly. Uh, that's where we created the base infrastructure on top of the Google Data Platform. Uh, what we saw is that previously, when it took uh, two months to uh, roll out a widget, now it was a mere two weeks. That's pretty amazing um, to go from uh, two months to two weeks. That's that's a lot of productivity. What about the performance or the 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 gain from a uh, elasticity standpoint? Again, the the, pro the stack that we picked was uh, PubSub, BigQuery, Dataflow, Bigtable, uh, and Elasticsearch. So we saw a tremendous drop. We saw about a twenty five twenty five percent cost efficiency uh, due to the elastic nature of infrastructure provided by uh, the Google Data Platform. Uh, in terms of our seller widgets, we drastically saw a reduction in uh, we saw a reduction from uh, around 11 milliseconds to 7 milliseconds, uh, which was <laughs> which was pretty interesting. So you had the cost benefit and you also had the uh, reduced latency. So that's a pretty amazing uh, journey. I noted on your profile that previously you also built a system that could ship 12 million orders a day, serving 3 billion. Uh, targeted ads a day, so you know a lot about scale. Uh, what would you say are the best practices, maybe the set of best practices you tell anyone to look at if they want to have a similar success to yours? That's a good question, Bruno. I think uh, getting back to the uh, to where we started, uh, it's very clear to have a few key items. One is data quality and understanding your single source of truth. Uh, now. As you have data that resides in your warehouse has been replicated across different use cases that you might have uh, more front facing, some might be more about uh, business analytics and whoever the internal customers uh, is really understanding what's that single source of truth. A uh, very, very clear metrics definition. Now, when we have very different businesses, uh, when we want to look at it, look at them from a bird's eye view, we need to make sure that these metrics can actually be aggregated and roll up. So uh, that's very critical. You can have your granular metrics that exist in your specific business unit, but you need to make sure that, hey, these are available when maybe the C-suite want to use it, or we, we want to use it for any other internal uh, purposes within uh, across different businesses. Uh, so I think like, you know, the source of truth, the data quality associated with data, uh, you know, very clear labeling in terms of the kind of different infrastructure assets that you have. Uh, you never know, <laughs> you know, today you start off, you might have a few assets, then later on it'll scale up, it'll scale up, it'll scale up, and then you'll be <laughs> having thousands and thousands of different services spun off. So, you know, you know having the little bit process oriented bits like, you know, clear label, labeling, clear cost uh, monitoring, because cost with data can go up exponentially. So, really understanding, you know, what's driving your cost and what are the underlying business metrics achieved by that spend. So, that's very critical because your CFO is going to come and say, hey, what happened? <laughs> so, then that's where, you know, you need to kind of uh, have those out there. And uh, really understanding what are the permissions associated with data. We, you, do, you do not want any leakages to happen. Uh, and I think that's where the Google Data Platform has an amazing uh, IAM and audit control. So you can literally get these off with a few clicks without uh, too much of uh, DevOps investments. That's great. That's a lot of best practices. Data quality, uh, metric definition, labeling, cost, and then of course security. What about the flip of that? What are some of the bad practices that you've witnessed or maybe something you would tell yourself at the beginning of this journey that you know, might make sense at the beginning, but now in retrospect, um, it could have been something to avoid? Some, some of them we learn from our mistakes. So like, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, this query that was running and uh, scanning petabytes of data, uh, we realized what were the kind of safety mechanisms that BigQuery had to offer. That's why we kind of looked at the whole uh, fixed slot model. So it, it not only solved these problems, but it also kind of, you know, helped us in our overall budgeting where we could start assigning different slots to businesses. So depending on your shape, size, and amount you're ready to spend, you know, we can assign you a set number of slots and you can go make merry with them, uh, run all your jobs. The day you realize that you, uh, you've reached the next leg of your journey, invest more. So 
it was out there. Uh, an, an, another interesting bit is, you know, when we look at big table. Big table, ha, uh, big table, you can also auto scale it. So when you have your big, big sale events, uh, you can scale up and scale down. It's very, very seamless. Uh, so uh, that's another key aspect to keep in mind. What's your What's your point on uh, auto scaling of slots on top of fixed slots? I'm trying to understand. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. So you can actually have, uh, if you want to be a little more dynamic for some of your businesses, you can have a fixed slot for maybe the periodic jobs and the day-to-day uh, the -day traffic requirements. And then you can also add the auto scale layer. You can have the additional spot, slot spun up for certain events. So maybe you have some uh, daily cron running at maybe at the first five minutes of every hour or whatever. So there probably you would not want to invest in having that fixed uh, compute capability. So you, you've got the mix. It's literally, you know, you look at the problem statement and look at the kind of dynamic that you want to op uh, offer from a DevOps perspective to a specific uh, business team. Um, similarly, I think uh, we look at the auto scale on big table. Uh, that's also very critical and you, you could save a lot of money. I noticed you have some uh, reduction in overall DevOps in, in cloud engineering uh, requirements. Tell me more about that. What did you experience, and how did you how did you get to that? Uh, so, so basically, what happens is like uh, from from our standpoint, from the Tokopedia engineering standpoint, we want to be very lean. And by lean, I mean really, you know, uh, keep as much as engineering effort as we have on the front lines, ready to go and pick up the next big. Uh, uh, multi-million dollar or billion dollar idea and by that it is about using services that have been tried tested and been used by customers similar to our size and maybe thousands of them that exist across globally and keeping this principle in mind we invest very little in terms of infrastructure and devops in fact like i said you know our data engineering team was around 15 ish resources till, till 2020 uh, considering the kind of scale we have uh, it's hard to believe but that's the reality and you do not want to so you can get these savings of almost 40% uh, uh, cost reduction engineering uh, efficiency as long as you know you follow the best practices and you you know you don't start reinventing the wheel now that's very common but we all know it, but we end up doing it at some point in time and realize that hey, you know, we need we need custom solutions. But really, if you think a little bit deep or you 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 brainstorm with your the data architects, the platform architects, you know, you you you'll get there and you'll understand the hidden gems that might not necessarily be so obvious up front. Well, that's an amazing journey. Fifteen people helping millions of products get to market. Uh, that was just an incredible data journey. Thank you for spending the time with us today, Ryan. Most welcome. My pleasure, Bruno. And if you want to find out more about customers just like this, make sure to click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.